Okay, now it's one minute past 12, so I suggest that we start. Um, welcome all to this year's last webinar of uh, NT New Team Society. Today it is about low carbon policies in China and Russia. And our speakers are from the Friedrich of Nansen Institute, Anna Korpo and Iselin Stenstal. And we have a discussant affiliated to the University of Bergen and the Norwegian Institute for International Affairs, Hans-Jürgen Gossemir. Um, before I give the word to Anna, I would just shortly uh, say what Team Society is. We are a group of uh, social science and humanities researchers from NTNU and see Team Society as a platform to strengthen um, social science and humanities research on energy and sustainability, and also to make this research more visible to a broader audience. Um, just uh, some practical things. This webinar is going to be recorded, just that you are aware of that. And questions can be asked in the chat and also just by raising your hand. Okay, then I would like to give the word to Anna. Thank you. Here we go. So many thanks for inviting us. Can you hear me okay now? Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. So very exciting indeed uh, to have published a book and very nice to be here to, uh, to talk to you about it. Um, we're three authors, uh, Iselin who's here and also Marius Korsnes. And it's been an interesting and fun project uh, funded by the Norwegian Research um, Council. So our topic um, uh, was informal institutions in policy implementation. And we were comparing low carbon policies in China and Russia. And it was Edward Elgar who published our book just now in November. Unfortunately, we haven't received the copies yet. I don't think easily you have either. So they are on their way, but we can't wave the book, which would have been fun. So they easily will show you a picture of it in the end because uh, she, will, uh, she will then uh, go on with the, um, uh, she will go on with uh, some case studies. So, um, so indeed our project was based on case studies and we were using different uh, kind of different kind of materials. Interviews were very important uh, when we're identifying uh, the informal institutions. <clears throat> so the starting point for us was that the governments uh, must have sufficient capacity to implement policy if they want to commit to greenhouse gas emission reductions on international level. Um, but because it's not so easy always to succeed with policy, um, we were interested in the role of informal institutions because we propose that they influence um, wh why policies succeed or fail in these countries where informal institutions are quite important part of the polities. And the weakness of formal institutions and the importance of formal informal institutions are it brings uncertainty to the outcome of policy processes. So we were very interested in how different stakeholders were kind of making use of informal institutions and whether they were aiming to achieve the formal policy goal or whether they were actually trying to divert this. And of course, we were to some extent comparing these two countries. So first, I'll just quickly outline the theoretical concepts of formal institutions. These are the environmental policy we're looking at. So they are rules and procedures which are created, communicated and enforced through channels which are official. Um, and these are laws and regulations mostly. And then their kind of counterpart is, are the informal institutions which are socially shared and mostly unwritten rules. <clears throat> which are then created outside the officially sanctioned channels. And uh, they can support or hinder the implementation of the formal institutions, so policy goals. And uh, if formal institutions are weak, so it means that the regulations are 
for instance, there might be something missing or they might just not be so very well defined. That tends to leave more space for informal institutions. So some other arrangements to get the policies implemented. And in some cases, it almost looks, especially in Russia, that these kind of informal institutions are almost required in order to get some uh, formal goals moving. I, of course, also non-institutional informal practices, which can hinder implementation. So it's, it's not so simple that everything's formal or informal. And here I'm just to show you the typology of the informal institutions, the, the uh, theoretical framework we were using in the book. I'm not going to go into the very details of this. It's, uh, I promised easily and I'm going to joke that then you can buy the book in order to get more information about this. But just to say that um, or when you look at the outcomes axis on effective formal institutions and ineffective formal institutions, there we are really talking about how, how well the formal policies are defined and how well are they really linked to the, the, the policy framework. So previously existing policies. Whereas if you, if you look at uh, the convergent divergent axis, there we are talking about whether the uh, informal rules, um, the, whether following the informal rules, they would lead to similar or different result that should ex be expected from the formal rules to be fulfilled. And here, this was Helm Ganlevitsky who have uh, first come up with uh, this framework, but we have slightly um, revised it with the help of German by adding the subversive in, uh, informal institutions. Then a couple of words about China and Russia as a comparison. Of course, they are both uh, major emitters of greenhouse gases. China the biggest and Russia the fourth biggest globally. Uh, in China, the growing emissions, they are very much because the economy is expanding as well as industrial activity, of course, and because there's still many poor people in China and the welfare level is improving. Of course, the domestic coal resources are also there, the important factor. At the same time, the per capita emissions remain fairly low for China. <clears throat> and there seems to be political will to address the climate crisis as we have seen that China is already looking towards carbon neutrality by 2060. But this is unfortunately not the case and the story in Russia where the per capita emissions are high due to inefficiencies in, in energy use and of course vast amounts of domestic fossil fuels available. Uh, so of course emissions did decline when the Soviet Union uh, collapsed but there hasn't really been very much action on the climate policy front since um, and emissions are slowly growing and the political will part is, is not there like it is in China. There are no ambitious climate targets in Russia. But still, at the same time, cl climate action tracker still considers both of the countries as insufficient in terms of Paris Agreement targets. So uh, Russia is slightly more insufficient than, than China, but they both have quite a long way to go still. So now, then I'm going to go through my Russia cases um, briefly. Um, I had actually, in the book, I have three cases. Um, but here I, I have put them in the format of two cases because the case two is really uh, this A and B are under the same legislation. So in the book you would find three chapters on Russia cases and two on China, but for this reason. <clears throat> so the associated petroleum gas flaring in Russia, it's, um, it was an interesting case in uh, terms of a climate effect, of course, it, it's, uh, it's about the emissions that uh, originate from oil wells when oil is being drilled and uh, taken out of the ground. So the Russian government, it established a 5% maximum flaring limit from 2012 and established accelerated fines uh, for those who were not achieving this formal policy goal. Uh, but uh, still the policy goal is only partially achieved. Uh, it would be possible to use this gas, it's basically methane for all sorts of uh, uses, both uh, 
as as an energy form or and also as a raw material for chemical industry and so on um, but the trouble is that it tends to be uh, located in a remote location so of course that's uh, that makes it more difficult to to get it to the end user so of course uh, this case is very much um, dominated by the state interest in the oil sector revenues that, that is only natural Russia is an oil exporter country so therefore one can admit that environment comes second um, and there are informal networks which are very powerful between top politicians uh, and the key people in the oil sector everybody's heard about this um, and uh, this kind of informal networks they have led to several exemptions of the five percent flaring limit so the oil sector has been able to use is influence to change the legislation really um, for instance the associated petroleum and gas uh, investments in order to reduce flaring uh, they could be they can now be deducted from the fines to be paid um, this is not just invented for the associated petroleum and gas case it also exists in the uh, Russian previous environmental legislation uh, but it was introduced there as a result of the uh, oil sector pushing for it with the help of the Ministry of Energy. Of course, there's also very little oversight of what kind of investments are these. This could be categorized as an informal institution. It could be categorized as state capture. Um, so uh, because the interest of uh, those who are target of this policy are so very strongly represented <clears throat> in the regulatory basis over time. Um, and also another case, there were various informal institutions identified. In this case, I only go through a couple of them um, because there's no space to go through all of them. Another interesting case was uh, the regulation which aimed at allowing the priority access for the associated petroleum gas to the Gazprom controlled trunk gas pipeline. But at the same time, it allowed Gazprom just to refuse the access. So it was like, okay, on one hand, they are supposed to allow it, but then nobody really is over overlooking their shoulders, seeing if they really do that. And they had a reason; they had like legitimate reasons just to say that without any monitoring. And this could also be considered as state capture. So they could just influence the formal rules. But it wasn't just the playground of the oil companies and, and Gazprom. Also, the political leadership was rejecting um, uh, the oil companies wanting to postpone the 5% limit. Uh, they were using the economic crisis as a reason, but this was, this was rejected. So there is some interest indeed in achieving the targets and they have partially been achieved, but the work goes on. And then briefly about the second case, which is about energy efficiency. Uh, of course, also the associated petroleum and gas has to do with improving energy, use of energy, so energy efficiency. But the case two is about the energy efficiency uh, federal law, 261 from 2009. And it was quite a complicated piece of legislation and like quite typical for Russian federal laws. It was uh, not very finalized when it was adopted. There were almost all the parts of the law, which I'm not gonna go into now, I'll focus on these two parts that I've been studying for this book, but also almost all parts required further legislation, further regula regulation, and then matching those uh, with existing le uh, legal basis. Um, and there still remain many gaps and uncertainties. They're very frustrating for those people and businesses who are trying to make their living uh, out of implementing this law. And the lack of political support has been uh, the kind of classic here uh, that uh, Dmitry Medvedev's presidential administration was pushing for this law through and then they were losing the interest in this topic and the funding dried out. So um, the formal goals, they have not been met. And then Putin, when he <laughs> regained, if you like, the office. So uh, he has been talking about it, but Yes, it's not really pushing for this. So the first uh, part of the law I was looking at were the energy saving companies. And this part of the formal institution so of, the, of the law was very weak. It was simply unclear how could such projects be implemented. The classical idea of an energy saving project is that 
a, a company goes to, for instance, industrial actor who is using energy and proposes how do we save energy and then makes its profit from those savings. And in Russia, it was not so simple. They ended up doing more or more or less consultancy work because there were no mechanisms set up how to do this legally. Um, but in any case, the non-institutional issues really dominated in, in the case of this sub-law. <clears throat> so there were gaps in legislation and <clears throat> indeed lack of interest by the authorities to improve this legislation, as well as mismatches with other regulatory bases on housing and public sector. <clears throat> also found some, <clears throat> some uh, signs of informal institutions in the form of informal networks again. Um, so there were some clear contacts uh, with, uh, between the regional level administrations and some of the important ESCOs. But this, their, their contact might have even pushed for the implementation of this part of the law. It, there was kind of, one can say that on one hand, there were potential for corruption and clientelism because these companies were involved in organizing the tenders that, which they then attended themselves and want, mostly won it because there were often one or two participants who were just um, participating in tender. But again, if the ESCO had not helped those administrations in the beginning when they knew very little about this, they might have not materialized at all. So it's difficult to judge. Then let's go to the final part I talk about, the fiscal incentives part of this law. Um, that was more sort of clear case in terms of informal institutions. Uh, there were three instruments where, which have been used fairly little. If you ask many Russian businesses, they just say there are, there are no such instruments to be used. Uh, so they're very weak formal institutions and they, one can say they largely exist on paper. But it was very clear that <clears throat> there was kind of selective use of law ongoing. Uh, because there, there was ongoing debate, for instance, whether commercial buildings are entitled to some of these energy efficiency tax breaks. And the ministry was advising one thing and the court decided another thing. So that's very unfair for the taxpayer if, if, because the idea was just that they would just report this in their tax return. We fulfill these requirements and we don't pay this tax. And then of course you might have to pay some penalty if the court like overrules your normal tax return. Um, and also there was some political all allocation of a very simple mechanism of investment tax credit. So that was mostly again between big companies and, and the state, whereas the smaller companies had no access to this. So I leave it here so that Iselin has time to go through the Chinese uh, cases and then outline some of our conclusions. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Hmm, let's see hmm. if I can share my screen. Uh, this one maybe. Good. Yes. Thank you so much for having us. Um, oh, do you now see? Oh, okay. Because I have the second screen. Sorry. Uh, let's see. I just need to do one more time mm -hmm. okay good here we are right so um, uh, so marius koshness he did the the second case uh, on solar pv uh, development and uh, and i did um, the the Shanghai ETS case uh, and uh, Shanghai, the Shanghai the ETS is the emission trading scheme uh, it's the most famous and the largest one so far is the EU one it's been operating for for some years uh, and in 2011 China decided to roll out a national carbon market as well and Shanghai was one of seven uh, pilot projects so that's what I studied uh, so. A carbon market, of course, is to put a price on carbon and to use market mechanisms to uh, curb uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, whereas um, the solar photovoltaic development, um, that has more to do with uh, power production. Uh, because, well, over the last, I think, 15 years, um, uh, electricity demand in China uh, has increased uh, roughly 14% per year 
So there's really a big demand to uh, to fulfill. Uh, so they're they're a bit uh, different in 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 scope, but uh, interesting nonetheless. So uh, going back to the the ETS. Uh, Shanghai covered about 300 different companies, the, the scheme, uh, and uh, what we saw was that there was a lot of informal contact between the government uh, and the businesses that the government used to sort of promote implementation and get the businesses to do what they were supposed to. Uh, and I also found that the companies in turn uh, had no interest of sabotaging or you know, be the one who made Shanghai not achieve uh, uh, a good compliance. Um, and uh, in terms of sort of, um, um, and this goes back to the 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 the, um, the table that Anna showed you. Um, number three, that they had this last minute auction because it was very important for Shanghai, the Shanghai government, uh, to show that they had 100% compliance. Uh, so a couple of times, they right before the, the deadline to surrender the allowances, they held these extra auctions. Uh, and it's not really sure if they sort of printed money, like they just uh, issued new allowances uh, and said, okay, if you need some, you can buy or if this was from a reserve already from the, from the cap um, that was sort of distributed uh, already. Uh, and if they printed money, if they printed allowances, uh, then, then it's sort of counter to the <laughs> reducing emissions, right? Uh, and what, uh, what Marius found uh, in his uh, case uh, was that um, the central, well, the, the, there is kind of a, a divergence between the interest of the central government and the local governments. Uh, so in my case, it was just for a one jurisdiction and solar PV development is all over the country. Uh, so the local governments in total actually, you know, they installed more uh, solar PVs than what the central government sort of set as goals. And this comes from regional competition. Uh, and um, uh, because it's, it's well, there are many, many regions and many cities in China. So it's, uh, um, it's, it's in the sort of government structure uh, that the, that the uh, local governments are sort of competing for a limited uh, amount of resources. Uh, he also found that there was a flexibility uh, on part of the financial institutions, which helped um, the local government sort of exceed the, um, the central government's targets. Um, but I mean, it's not all sort of pointing in the, in the same direction. Uh, there was also local protectionism uh, for uh, places that were uh, rich in coal. They would perhaps um, prioritize coal over uh, using the solar PV generated uh, power. Uh, and yeah, it's uh, number four is, is kind of the same cur curtailing. So not feeding the, the solar generated power into the, into the grid, but uh, uh, choosing uh, coal fired uh, produced electricity instead. Right. So if we compare the two countries um, based on our four cases, what do we see? Um, so in China, it seems that it's the, the informal institutions are flexible so they can support the formal goal, uh, the informal uh, communication and also sort of the companies wanting to be on good terms. Uh, but we also see a, a self-interest, you know, that the local governments are choosing coal over, over solar PV. And it seems to be quite important that there are other benefits uh, to be had from, from implementing. Uh, so for Shanghai, it, uh, it will be, uh, will host the exchange, the national exchange for the national uh, ETS. Uh, and for the solar PV, this is, you know, the re regional competition that I, I mentioned. 
And as for, for China, uh, so the, no, sorry, for Russia, <laughs> uh, comparing to Russia. So the, as Anna has sort of shown us already, uh, where the formal institutions are weak, uh, there are also created gaps in uh, the legislation. Um, and this is also a flexibility, which sometimes are sort of intentional, uh, so that um, individual networks can pursue their own goals. Uh, and uh, state officials are also sort of participating in contradictory laws. Uh, however, the informal institutions in Russia are also spurring some action. Uh, so it's not, um, it's not, uh, although the main trend might be sort of uh, going against the, the formal policy, it's, it's not just that. And uh, uh, what we ended up with in our book, uh, we ended up with some end hypotheses. Uh, to because we have four cases, so you know, hard to generalize. But um, these are sort of our, our suggestions on what to pursue further in uh, in um, uh, in research to confirm or or disconfirm. So we found that the, I mean the informal institutions are deeply embedded in the policy in the polities of of, of these two countries, and we found that they seem to work against on a general level uh, in, in Russia and more towards the formal policy goal in China. And that tells us that the informal institutions have different roles. Uh, but as I mentioned, there's also sort of a, a dual effect here. And uh, we had five hypotheses. Um, so what can we say about the state? Well, we see in both countries that uh, while they have different roles and sort of um, used uh, informal institutions differently, the state is in, deeply involved in both countries. Uh, and furthermore, uh, data uh, is quite important uh, and sort of a common red thread <laughs> through our cases because uh, it was hard to find reliable uh, data with high confidentiality um, and uh, and uh, this sort of lack of data or obscuring data or, or keeping the uh, data away from the public uh, seems also to be an important part of the informal institutions in, in both countries right and uh, we actually have uh, this. Uh, <laughs> this is the book, uh, as you can see here. And uh, to our audience today, um, Anna was in contact with the, with the publishers and, uh, and they were gracious enough to, to give us this code. So if you use this CURP35, uh, then you can get 35% of our book uh, and it's valid. Uh, through next year. And uh, that was my 10 minutes. So I'll, I'll stop here and I look forward to Hans Jürgen's comments and also uh, our discussions afterwards. Thank you, Anna and Iselin, for the great introduction to your new book. I would now like to give the word to Hans Jürgen for his comments, questions, before we then continue with a uh, common discussion afterwards. All right, so hello everyone, and thank you so much, Anna and Islam, for your uh, presentation and, and uh, congratulations on your book. Uh, so I've uh, listened to your presentations, uh, which I also saw a bit of in, um, in advance, and I've seen some of the chapters, uh, but I assume that I've read a bit, and most of our listeners today have not read anything at all because the book is not out yet. Uh, so I will not go into details about like, um, I will pose questions that all are related to what you're talking and writing about, uh, but I'm still a bit curious to see to what extent you address those in the book or, and uh, to what extent you're like, um, uh, what do you think about them uh, as of now? 
when the book is finished and you're not able to go back and um, uh, luckily probably it feels to go back and do any, any uh, changes. Uh, and uh, I've done, I've, I'm not, uh, first of all, I've worked mostly on China. I don't know the Russian case uh, so well. I do uh, quite a bit of sustainability related work, but not especially related to climate. But I've done a, used a lot of uh, new institutionalist theory and the formal, informal institutionalist frameworks in my own work. So I'll start out with that, and then I have a couple of other questions related to other processes of your work. So I think both Anna and especially both Anna and Eslin, and, but especially Anna, you mentioned a few times the kind of blurred lines between what is formal and what is informal, right? Uh, so in my own work, I've um, also uh, str still struggled with this when so-called informal institutions or practices are so widely practiced and so widely expected and so widely known, uh, does it still make sense to refer to them as informal? Because everyone expects them to happen. Uh, so I've started using different kind of levels of formality and, and kind of playing around with words like see my formal and stuff. The other way, one is, which you might be a bit clearer about in your writing, in your book, you probably are, but that's also the tricky part between distinguishing between policies that you do obviously write a lot about, which, which is an institution in itself, compared to what you could call more implementation related institutions. And that's important because when we discuss what's weak and strong and what's working and not working, because you can obviously have um, uh, policies that we can consider weak because they don't set very clear goals or, uh, or they, um, they're not very ambitious. Uh, but of course, the implementation related institutions, the actors and, uh, and um, the processes around that might still be functioning quite uh, well. Uh, so I was wondering uh, your in your distinction between those uh, between Russia and China in that sense, if the main explanatory kind of uh, difference is the ambition in terms of the uh, low carbon related policies, or if it's the apparatus around that works to uh, to reach those uh, goals, and that I think is always an interesting kind of. Uh, uh, distinction. In my, in my own work, I've applied it quite a lot to uh, Chinese policies around civil society and civil society regulations and so forth. And those formal policies are very vague because the state is very reluctant to go forward with big formal changes. So lots of informal institutions that make those part of society function um, but uh, the, the formal policy, you can say it's weak uh, because it's not, it's not intended to be very clear because that gives the state a lot of room to navigate and move into uh, control. So, it's, so the distinction between like a, a control mechanism or what's also in the Chinese case and probably also Russia where informal policies or like vague formal policies is also about what you write about experimentation and also maximizing the opportunity for local uh, communities and local governments to maximize the kind of local adaptability and appropriateness. So that in a sense is a strong policy uh, or you could argue it's a strong for formal policy because it gives room to a lot of effective enforcement through either a combination or probably a, always a combination of formal and uh, informal. Uh, so that I would uh, be great to hear a bit more how you distinguish informal and, and formal and the, the policy versus kind of policy implementing um, uh, institutions. And then uh, of course, being in Norway and I don't research Norway, but quite a few I, I would expect in the, um, amongst the, the viewers today do. So, Having like listened to, I think, uh, honest take on the Russian low carbon policies not not being very uh, or being a bit weak. How would you should we consider Norwegian policies in that sense? A very uh, uh, oil producing country with still high ambitions to maintain a high oil production, 
whilst pushing for what uh, we are here referring to as a green shift. Is that a weak formal policy or is it uh, in your kind of theoretical framework? Would it be a weak formal policy or, or what would it be, right? Um, and then of course, uh, it's always when we talk to researchers like myself and like you guys, uh, to uh, look a bit into the future. That's not something we like to do, but do we expect on China and Russia's part a tougher, and if we expect a tougher, to what extent, right? In terms of promoting uh, tougher, low carbon related uh, policies. Uh, and that goes to my, uh, a couple of my more kind of uh, softer questions, I guess is the, uh, I, I think we do way too little generally comparisons between Russia and, and China and, and, and does uh, very much welcome your, your approach. Uh, but from your understanding, uh, what's the benefit and the struggle or like the, the, the challenge of comparing these countries? Because they're obviously extremely different in their political system, in their history, in their, in their institutions. Uh, although they're, we both refer to them as um, authoritarian. Of course, one country has a, um, at least a, a, an election process and a, and, a, and a setup with a political opposition and with those types of institutions that are simply not present in the Chinese system. And of course, when we talk about policy and policy development and policy implementation, that probably makes quite a bit of a difference, right? Um, and then uh, lastly, I would like to know, so this is, uh, it's a monograph, right? Written by three people. It's not like an edited. Uh, so what's like the, the pain and the gain of going into that and doing that together? Because everyone who has tried to and keep trying to write a book, that is bloody hard on its own. So what's like the, is it easier to, to push each other or is it just worse? So, but thank you again. Looking forward to uh, hearing that joint uh, discussion. Thank you. Perfect questions. <laughs> Very good. I'll start from the um, from the beginning. Uh, Iselin, do you do you want to do it such way that we go through each question and you you add rather than go through it all again? Uh, you can go first and I can add. Yeah. That's yeah, but, okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll shout if I... Yeah, shout. Do that. Yeah. That's good. <clears throat> so, blurred lines. Um, on, so, what is formal and informal? It's indeed they are widely expected in these polities. Um, but I do think that it still makes sense to uh, differentiate between formal and informal policy because... Um, it's um, as you can see, we have to take this kind of somewhat static approach to what is formal and what is informal, and kind of look away to some extent from this kind of question because it would be quite difficult otherwise to analyze and to compare, and that's why we we drew the line on the written goal, written policy. There were sometimes cases like the Russian energy efficiency law, that the law itself doesn't really always set up very clear goals, but there are goals established elsewhere, for instance, in a presidential order. And it can be a very high level goal in the sense that the, it, it applies to the whole energy system, but it is a goal. And um, I just feel that if we start too much focusing on how the lines are somewhat blurred that would make it sort of like it would make it impossible to study this question and I think one can find many sort of uh, explanations and details about this that does sort of draw a deeper picture of how policies get or do not get implemented in these countries than if one gets too caught in, in, in the blurriness of, of, of it. Iselin, do you want to add something? Yeah, no, um, I mean, I also use semi-formal well, formalities mm -hmm. when talking about China, but yeah, as Anna said, we, for comparisons, 
we kind of had to sort of set. And this was also a struggle, you know, like, okay, so is this really an informal or is it just an informality? Um, yeah, so the, but since we were actually, you know, making the same um, categories for, for the different four cases, then they had to be a bit, they had to be a bit sort of strict, um, yeah. Can I just ask one question also, uh, maybe both Islin and Hans-Jürgen, because when you say it's semi-informal, semi-formal, then I think it, it sounds more Chinese than Russian, frankly, <laughs> because it, in, in, in Russia, it's, I mean, everything is kind of pretty informal, but yep. there are written things that they might not get implemented, but they are there and they are formal. So what do you actually mean by this semi-formal? Uh, well, I'll go first since there you uh, go, Sergei has muted it. Uh, well, for me, it's it's those informalities that are so that they appear so often that they are sort of institutionalized. Or yeah, it's it's they're I mean they're not formal because they're not written down in our mm -hmm. what we had yeah. as a very strict uh, mm -hmm. definition in our book. But um, yeah. They 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 appear to function as a sort of a almost as a formal institution. So they're semi-formal for me. Mm -hmm. Hans, they, in my um, if I remember correctly, because this is one of the um, two of the article that is in the shelf that I'm picking, hopefully picking up before Christmas to finalize. Uh, it's the types of institutions uh, that are not written, uh, so they're not formalized in an official kind of regulatory manner, but they're not only accepted as informal institutions tend to be in an authoritarian country, right? So it's an accepted practice, but they're also added to that. They're also embraced in the sense that official government representatives actively participate in those forums or those processes or hearings or uh, where these non-formalized actors or processes play out. So that's why, and they, they span out over uh, a long period of, of time. And for me, it has been difficult to call that informal because it's, it, um, it plays out in a very semi-formal setting. So that's why I ended up having to kind of use a marker for what's, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that this will turn into a formal policy, which uh, a policy process or institutionalization is often about. It cannot very often also end with a backlash. Mm. It's a weak, non-formalized, but uh, more formal than other types of accepted institutions. Mm. I, would, I would still include that into the categorization of informal institution because it is unwritten rule which is probably also somewhat sanctioned but in a social way whereas then what as i pointed out in the beginning then there are these sort of non-institutional factors they might play in some cases play out same way but they are just like they are more sort of private <laughs> attempts to get something through and it's i think at least there's some similarity to this maybe that they are kind of like more uh, maybe more recognized informal institutions so that that it is quite and as we as easily point out that the uh, the state is very much info involved in the informal institutions and that's that's clear it, it, it doesn't that's no to us it was no criteria to call something formal because the state actions often are informal in these countries I think we should move on if we were to. Yes, we should. Yeah, I know, I know. But there's just a really, really interesting question. That's why I get, that's why I get stuck. <laughs> sure. Um, um, let me see what was next. The policies. We yes, uh, implementation. implementation related policy. Um, did, did, did you have something to that, Islin? Um, yeah, so in the China literature, which uh, Hans mm -hmm. and uh, I know, um, so this is, uh, I guess, the, the flexibility or the intentional um, vagueness of, of policies or 
um, sort of hailed as one of the reasons why the party state is successful uh, and sort of <laughs> uh, adapting to new uh, new situations. Um, so, uh, uh, but I think um, we didn't really, I mean, we didn't really compare and say that the, the Shanghai ETS was unambitious, whereas the central no. goal for the PV installation was ambitious. Um, that was not sort of a judgment we did in the book. Um, we just took the goals as matter of factly and then tried to see did they actually achieve their goals. Um, yeah, that's... Um, yeah, maybe the interesting part was also that in Russia there was even um, a terminology on this that uh, there were policies which were kind of labeled as grazing fields. Some regulation had some element which was kind of installed there by someone who then could see someone else, some some contact taking, you know, making the most of it through informal institutions. So it's there was in both countries there were these elements. Maybe just then the question about the distinction uh, between Russia and China on the ambition. Yeah, indeed, that was one thing that becomes obvious on, on, in terms of climate policy, and we actually have sought more money to study it. Uh, what kind of what kind of factor is that in in policy uh, implementation as well? But it it would indeed seem that the Chinese approach is much more ambitious, and it reflects into this this particular policy type and that's why we also obviously couldn't generalize from climate policy study into the more sort of wider Chinese sort of policy implementation realm as Hans Jürgen was also pointing out that there were other policy types which do not follow this, this pattern. Then on the Norwegian policy, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, did, did you have some, was this question also to the audience maybe? Um, Why don't yeah. we end on that? We, we I think we can end on that, that and then more people can join in. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, well, it was, uh, what was, I think it was uh, the benefit of, of comparing these countries and the challenges, indeed, the difficulty of, of trying to, trying to uh, make somehow uh, the analysis sort of like static enough in order to have something to compare. And of course, the, the challenge is always to try to find data in, in, in both China and Russia slightly different ways and know what data you have. What does it actually, where did it come from? Can you rely on that? That was one major thing. But this is a very wide discussion. All the kind of problems you get from trying to compare these two polities, which Hans Jürgen was already pointing out, have very significant di differences. So I don't think we can like finish this discussion here. Um, <laughs> monograph by three people. It was fun, I think. I, I, we divided it in such a way that I was responsible for a lot of the um, the theoretical background uh, and, and coming up with this theoret theoretical framework. And, and Itzlin and, and Marius were then sort of working with me on that, but I took the lead on writing those. And the, we to all took the lead on writing particular um, case studies. And then I think I, it seems to me that it worked well. It would have been a very different book if I had had sort of like sole responsibility of writing some parts, so. Yeah, uh, so for me, I think the benefit of comparing China and Russia is, um, yeah, there are differences, but but often they are sort of lumped together, you know, because they're not non-democratic. Uh, and so to sort of challenge that and sort of actually show the differences uh, with details, I think that's um, that's uh, that's one benefit. Uh, but it was also a struggle because it became very clear that we understood the world uh, from where we came from. So we kind of had to, <laughs> I am by no means a Russia expert, but there was a lot of uh, familiarizing and discussing um, so I think Marius and I probably had a sort of more positive uh, view of informal institutions going into it, whereas Anna's was more negative, just sort of based on what we knew, right? In China, I can sort of, yeah, it's the, the grease that uh, greases the wheels, whereas in Russia, it seems to be uh, a more negative aspect of the polity. So, uh, so uh, yeah, that was just sort of finding a common ground, uh, I think was uh, was a challenge. Um, but 
when we sort of got there, I think it was also uh, something good uh, and and uh, a bit different from from other uh, more edited volumes where people just sort of send in their 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 research and and someone writes a you know introductory chapter in my conclusion. So it's a much more uh, worked through. Um, theoretical framework and cases and conclusions. Yeah. And the future. Anna, you want to go? What's the Russian climate future? Oh, you're on mute. You go first, yeah. <clears throat> oh, okay. So uh, for China, uh, I'm mm, quite optimistic. Um, of course, we, we, uh, we're nowhere near sort of reaching the 1.5 degree um, uh, temperature rise. However, I think it's quite positive that uh, Xi Jinping in September announced that China aims for carbon neutrality by 2060. Uh, so this is uh, a couple of years ago, I think 2014, they announced that they will peak uh, before 2030 or around 2030. Uh, and now that they have sort of announced the, the, the zero point, it's in the Chinese interest to make this hill as <laughs> uh, not the steep uh, sort of, what do you say, uh, to, to make the, the peak as low as possible because they also had to, you know, go down from the mountain. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, and is that ambitious or not? Um, I think, the Chinese way of promising things internationally is to be quite conservative. So, I mean, if we're lucky, they will uh, achieve carbon neutrality even before 2030, no, 2060, uh, and peak before 2030. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's not easy. Otherwise it would have been implemented a long time ago. There's other factors and as we said, uh, saw the, you know, the local protectionism of coal and, keeping the economy running so um uh, it's a challenge but uh, but i think we will see more uh, more efforts from china to reduce emissions unfortunately i can't be as positive about russia <laughs> as at least he was pointing out surprise surprise yeah. yeah well there isn't really any ambitious climate policy in russia there are policies which can deliver some emission reductions some of them won't get implemented for other reasons as we have shown in the book and elsewhere um the russian government doesn't really have any scenario of emissions that we would recognize as green they have used green color on one that ends up on the same level of emissions in 2050 where we are now so the thought is the, their green scenarios which they call it is that they're going to peak around the same time as China and then return to this level where they are now. So it's, you would need the target and probably another administration, but we'll, time will tell. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, do we have other questions or maybe thoughts about the Norwegian policy? Anyone? was raised before. <laughs> I don't know if you can raise your, yeah, Thomas, you have raised your hand. Yeah, yeah sure, I can. I, I didn't wanna ask actually about the Norwegian policy, but I had a different kind of <laughs> comment question, if that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. So thanks a lot for the great presentation. Really interesting stuff. So I was, uh, but I was wondering uh, as I was listening both to the discussant and to, to your presentation. So, uh, I, yeah, I, I guess we might come to this from slightly different uh, sides of things. And uh, this this whole uh, discussion about institutions, I mean, it's, it's a huge thing across the social sciences, isn't it? And, and it means widely different things. Um, and uh, it seems that what you've studied here then uh, are some relatively distinct patterns of actions, networks uh, relatively closely tied to formal policymaking processes that can feed into uh, how things get shaped and, and these kinds of things. So, and of course I agree, this can be both a enabler and a barrier to sort of the implementation of uh, 
new policies. Uh, but I was interested in uh, links sort of between the types of uh, informal institutions that you've studied and I guess the wide range of other informal institutions that populate these societies and uh, um, how you uh, how you think about, for instance, so one thing that struck me as I was listening to this is that, well, they, these can be seen as uh, enablers and, bar and barriers to implementation of policies, but I guess they can also be seen as, for a very distinct group of actors, uh, enablers to access to, to sort of the realms of formal power, whereas they're quite clearly sound exclusionary to a lot of other actors. So I was I was uh, kind of, um, yeah, uh, interested in your reflections about the relationships between the types of informal institutions that we've, you've studied and other informal institutions and uh, what their absence uh, might tell us about these societies, I guess, uh, broad and blurry question, but uh, if it makes sense. Who's, or what's ab absence? No, I'm so so. Uh, the rest of society, basically. So so you've you've studied here, I guess, particular groups that have access to particular discussions that enable policymaking or disable policymaking, whereas there are, of course, uh, all sorts of other networks in society where other actors are um, that aren't part of these processes. Uh, perhaps the question doesn't make sense because of our yeah. Okay. No, it does make sense. I, um, well, yes, in, for instance, I was talking about the oil case and there, of course, they're very powerful stakeholders involved in there. So they kind of, it looks like it's them who get involved in the informal institutions. And on that sector, it would be because they are the stakeholders of that sector. But if you, for instance, look at the ESCOs, the energy saving companies, they're very kind of small and I could say unimportant companies, small companies somewhere in Novosibirsk, really, who would want to make some profit from what they can do. And they might also have networks. The networks uh, in, in Russia, at least, they shouldn't just be seen as like top level power networks. They are, they are networks everywhere. Um, and in the, in the Soviet days, they were called bloods. They were called more sort of personal networks of, of helping and sort of abusing the state's resource, really. And, but in these days, it's of course gone bigger and some of the stakeholders have been able to like gra grab a, a more significant share of what used to be the Soviet state's part and they have gained therefore what we call power. Um, and I suppose that is kind of taking it to the society level to some extent, um, but um, the society's role here in general, well, if the, the, the policy, uh, the political system is somehow tolerated or might be changed by the society as a whole. And if it, if kind of things go too intolerable or crazy, I suppose there could be some kind of a change of power. So through that, of course, you know, the society could maybe change this approach, but for now, at least in Russia, this kind of, kind of dual state that we have what they like to call democratic institutions. And then we have the actual power structure on the background, which is making use of what we call informal institutions is, is the reality. Did that answer any of your question? Yeah, yeah I'm sure it's, it's uh, definitely, oh, quite. I know that, uh, but... definitely on target. So, yeah, um... but there could be so much more said about that. It would be another book. <laughs> Iselin, do you want to add something? Uh, I think Anna's answer suffices and it's already one o'clock, so mm. I waver my right to speak. Great. So if there's no urgent question from the audience, I would like to thank the speakers and the discussant and also say that the webinar will be available on the website so that we can distribute it to the people who were not able to join today. And uh, we will continue with more webinars next year and information will be sent out soon. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
Bye Thank bye. you. And if you if you do have further questions later on, just send us an email. We keep talking about this because we spend so much time studying. <laughs> That's true. So, many thanks to everybody. And